Welcome to today's webinar, How Scott Catholic High School Switched to a Better MDM. We've got a really great treat for you guys here. Um, my name is Nick Thompson, and I'm the host today. Uh, but more importantly, joining me uh, from Omaha is uh, both Mike Bailey and Oliver Bantam. Uh, guys, thanks for joining us. Yep, no problem. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so um, Mike and Oliver here are going to talk to us about uh, their experience of switching uh, their MDM providers mid-year here. Um, and I want to just take a minute, if you guys can just give us a little bit of uh, uh, overview of who you guys are and what you do at uh, Scott Catholic High School. Uh, so I'm Mike Bailey, and I am the assistant principal um, so on top of all my traditional assistant principal sort of duties, um, originally when we went to uh, our M or our one-to-one -one environment three years ago, uh, I was also the facilitator of that as well. So for that first year of the program, um, I was doing all of the traditional assistant principal duties uh, as well as, um, like I said, sort of facilitating that one-to-one -one program as well. Great. Thanks, Mike. And then I'm Oliver Bantam. I'm the coordinator of instructional technology, uh, which is kind of a fancy word for iPad guy. Um, I'm not a traditional IT person. I actually have a school administration background, but I was pretty heavy-handed in the technology at my last school, which was a bring-your-own-device um, 9 through 12 high school. And then after Mike's first year, they actually expanded uh, the administrative role here and made a new position which is what I'm currently in now to kind of alleviate Mike's work uh, in the technology area. And that's kind of my primary focus is the iPad program and training teachers. And we use a, a third party management company. So I don't have to, you know, work on servers and, and stare at blinking lights and try to figure out those types of issues. I just kind of call in. So I'm a little bit different uh, when you hear the word technology in a title, you kind of expect someone to have a pretty formal background, but I do not. So. Um, we're, we're both kind of a, uh, a blend of assistant principals and uh, kind of tech Google junkies and, and iPad uh, enthusiasts. That's great. No, thank you guys. Uh, and I think we have a lot of our customers out there that are in similar positions as you. Um, and uh, again, we want to thank you for uh, coming on and just telling your story here. So um, let me just walk through what we'll be covering uh, in, the, in the presentation here. So um, we're going to just do a brief overview of uh, both uh, Scott Catholic and of JAMF uh, for those who aren't familiar with uh, our product and what we do. Uh, then we'll have a discussion about uh, device ownership models uh, and sort of what works best in different environments and uh, hear from uh, uh, both Mike and Oliver about what worked for them. Um, and then after device ownership models, you need to actually choose what sort of device you want to use in education. And we'll have a discussion around that. And then how they actually executed this mid-year switch from the communication, the planning, and the execution of that. And we'll wrap up with some next steps and Q&A. So first off, um, let's do a little bit of uh, overview here uh, of, of our different companies, our, our organizations. Uh, and so I'd like, uh, you know, uh, Mike and uh, Mike and Oliver here to just talk about Scott Catholic and really what makes your guys' school unique and maybe provide us some context so we can sort of better understand your MDM story here. Sure. Um, and and any time we have talked to groups about um, this sort of MDM transition that we went through, we, we always sort of preface it with... Um, we have a, we feel like a very unique situation uh, in that uh, we are a, a private co-ed Catholic high school uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and so part of that, unlike a, a traditional public high school uh, that might be in a, a large district that may have multiple high schools, it may have multiple feeder middle schools, it may have even more sort of feeder elementary schools, uh, we're a little bit of a standalone entity, meaning um, we are an archdiocesan school. Uh, there are three other archdiocesan high schools in the Omaha metro area, um, as well as five other Catholic order schools. So there's actually eight K-12 
Catholic high schools in the Omaha metro area. Um, but the thing that makes us kind of unique is because we don't have any feeder middle schools, um, the other archdiocesan high schools, they really kind of do their own thing. And so we're sort of an island unto ourselves a bit. So that certainly was an advantage for us in that when it comes time to making decisions about um, certainly not only our, our technology program, but really most everything we do, um, we only really need to take into consideration, is this what's best for, for our students and for our families and for our staff? And if the answer to all three of those is yes, uh, then we have sort of the autonomy to do that uh, so long as we can uh, you know, get it past our bosses and, and certainly our, our school board of directors and, and we can come up with the finances for it. Um, we, can, we can do just about anything we want. Uh, so that certainly is a huge advantage. I understand I worked for 16 years um, in some huge public school districts and I understand um, sort of the bureaucracy that takes place when it comes to decision makings and certainly how the, the uh, the wheels of progress can turn a little bit more slowly. Um, you know, we're pretty fortunate that basically our timeline when we first brought in our one-to-one -one program from the time we sort of, we dreamt up the idea in like October or November and we were green-lighted and deploying iPads by that July. Um, so, so we're able to make things happen pretty fast. Um, if and when we want to do them. And so we always sort of tell that little bit up front just so everybody understands, hey, um, we're able to do some things uh, with a pretty short timeline just based on the unique nature uh, of our school. So that being said, um, we're, about, we're about 730 students roughly. Um, a relatively medium-sized school. Most of the surrounding public schools uh, and even most of the, the Catholic high schools in town are, are much larger than we are. Um, the, we're surrounded within less than two miles, um, three high schools that are close to being around 3,000 um, students, whereas our 730, we're pretty small. Yeah. That's uh, that's great to, to just put things in context there. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm sure a lot of schools wish they had the sort of autonomy that, that you do as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was something that was very attractive um, when moving here in the first place. I bet. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to just breeze past, uh, you know, who we are real quickly. Just um, you know, we're Jamf. If anyone doesn't know us, we help organizations succeed with Apple. That's our tagline. Um, and the two products that we do that with is uh, Jamf Now and Jamf Pro. Um, and we're going to talk about um, you know the, these in. in we can go far more in depth technically if you want to later on, uh, but uh, this is just a brief overview of uh, sort of what the products do. Uh, it's a quick screenshot of it. And to just let you know, we help a wide range of organizations, uh, but I think we're most proud of the schools that we've helped. We have over 4,000 schools uh, using Jamf, and uh, education has always uh, been something close to Jamf, just like it's been something close uh, to Apple as well, too. So. Um, in this discussion here, I want to talk about uh, the different technology ownership models that are out there for students, right? Um, you have a wide range of different ones that are available from uh, a one-to-one -one, uh, scenario. You have uh, shared devices. So you have multiple people using one uh, device where it kind of can get checked in and checked out. And you have BYOD as well too, or bring your own device. Um, now guys, you've had a wide range of uh, ownership models uh, at Scott Catholic. Can you sort of just talk about your experience uh, with the different models that you've tried? Uh, yeah, well, to get the uh, program kind of up and going, we wanted to do uh, school-owned and school-issued devices, uh, but we kind of ran into uh, re some resistance from our board um, because they were taking into account some of the families that may have devices. Um, so they said, you guys can do that, but if a family comes to you with a uh, device or a, is in a BYOD situation and it meets the minimum standard requirements that you guys have put forth, they can, they can do that. They can use that device. And we said, that's fine, but it's going to be enrolled in an MDM. So we, we had a blend. It was probably 
uh, 80%, maybe closer, 85 were um, school-issued devices, and then the remaining 15% of students were BYOD. Um, what we learned after pretty much the first year is the BYOD isn't what we want. Um, it may work for some schools, but it's, it's not what we want as far as how we want to manage them. And then the actual um, time spent configuring those, um, those of you who aren't familiar with how to get a BYOD into um, in enrolled in JAMF, uh, or, or any MDM is, uh, and there may be some different ways, but the way that we were uh, using it was at, uh, plugging them into Apple Configurator and dropping in profiles. So we're, we're moving away from that and we're going in the future here to uh, DEP devices and zero touch configuration, uh, but we, we have currently two grades that were uh, kind of grandfathered in under bring your own device and are uh, going to be out the door after this school year. So we're kind of excited about that, but that's mm -hmm. kind of how we got there was it was a little give take uh, to have flexibility in our programs for some of our families. Yeah, that's great. And, and so you've sort of landed now on one-to-one, uh, -one, correct? Correct. So what you know, what was the, the main driving factor that you decided to go with one-to-one -one versus shared? We, we never did shared, and that wasn't really anything we were interested in from the beginning, uh, just because we wanted the students to have it for all eight class periods. We didn't want to do the carts. Mike lived through uh, the carts and getting them passed around and charged and getting them checked out. So we knew from the beginning that wasn't going to be an option for us. We wanted every student in our building have the device with them at all times. So that's kind of wasn't an avenue we went down, but the uh, the one to one in the BYOD we definitely have uh, experience with. Yeah, and it's it's certainly something that uh, you know if you're competing almost uh, for students as you are sort of in your market, um, you know one having a one to one model can really help sort of differentiate you as a school as well. Without a doubt, and and that's sort of back to that organizational profile a little bit. Um, another sort of thing that I mentioned is just geographically where we're located, we're only about, this is only our 24th year of existence. Um, Omaha, like most major metropolitan areas, most of the, the private Catholic schools are located in, in our case, in eastern Omaha or the older part of the city. But about 25 years ago, uh, the Archbishop decided he wanted a um, a Catholic high school in, in suburban Omaha, essentially, and so we were built. Um, but we're surrounded on three sides by three absolutely fantastic public school districts um, that are huge, great schools. I've worked in two of the three, um, and they're free. Um, so for sure, that, that part of what we do um, is always trying to be on that cutting edge, always trying to provide something for our families that makes us particularly attractive, um, maybe outside of those other public options that, that are free. Yeah, absolutely. So that then leads us to the next decision uh, that both you and a number of schools need to make. And that, of course, uh, is what sort of device do you want to actually have uh, with your students, right? So you need to evaluate uh, because there's so many different choices out there now, right? We've got iOS devices, we've got Macs, we've got Chromebooks, we've got traditional PCs. Um, can you walk us through how you guys made the decision that you did to go with iPads? How'd you evaluate these different platforms? Well, for us initially, um, it was, we started the research process by just talking to people, um, trying to talk to as many people as possible, both locally and, and then through some sort of other connections and things. We had some people um, regionally um, in terms of what they were doing. Um, and, you know, really uh, for us, I, I would say that one thing that um, drove this this move initially is we have the very good fortune of having a principal um, that that really is a visionary. I mean, he really um, he had a vision for what he wanted. He had a a dream of what we could be, 
um, and had so we were able to sort of start from the end and work our way backward. And, and what really sort of motivated us was after doing a lot of research and, and looking what was available out there was for us, we wanted a device that would allow our students and our staff to create content. Um, so we say all the time that, that for us, the iPads, are a, they're, a, they're a creation device, whereas some of the other devices out there that we looked at, some of the Chromebooks and those types of things were great um, for consuming. Um, if you wanted to, if you were doing web searches and, and you know, even some, some word processing and those types of things, those devices were great. But certainly when we tried to compare them side by side and um, the ability to actually create content um, based on the applications that were available at the time, and, and, and certainly I don't think it's changed that much even today, here we are three years in, uh, that for us the Apple devices were without a doubt the direction we wanted to go. Um, that certainly backed by um, Apple's commitment to education. Uh, uh, and it just so happened, I think, and part of this happened, uh, you know, simultaneously as, as our principal had been had been doing some reading and, and doing some research on these companies and, and you know, Simon Sinek a little bit starts with why, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that idea behind Apple is that um, they were an education first company and that was really uh, their drive and, and what was part of their, their mission and vision from the very start. Uh, so that's for us what really what moved us to Apple. Um, then why, why we chose the iPad as opposed to, you know, MacBooks or Mac Air or whatever it was, really was um, uh, a cost factor for us. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's... And, and one thing to add is, uh, and, and I kind of experienced this other places, is if, if something goes wrong with the device physically, where do you take it? I know there's <laughs> all sorts of... Uh, do you get it, do you take it to the place you bought it to get it repaired? Do you take it to the the strip mall shop down the the way with uh, that replaces screens and that kind of stuff? Well, with something like Apple Care, and I know you can get insurance on some other devices, but the ability to call and say, "Hey, I need to get a replacement device," they send you a box. Next day, you got it. You send it back, and within three day turnaround, you have a brand new iPad. And we overbought a, uh, a couple devices just to. Uh, switch out immediately if that's the case, but um, other devices that we would probably have looked at in comparison didn't really have those types of programs in place. So it kind of led us to Apple initially because of that, and then the, uh, the like Mike said, the, the iPad for what we want to do with them as well as probably the cost at first um, as far as getting it up and going. That's great. That's uh, excellent to hear your guys' evaluation process here. And you're even uh, a Google school. You use some of the Google backend services, and they work great on Apple products as well, too. So Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, we, we use that all the time. We use that more than uh, any of the action. And that's just us again, but yeah. um, more than probably the Apple apps that come on there just because it's cloud-based. And um, what we want to do educationally is, is more in the Google uh, world than than maybe some of the other things that are a little more stagnant. Yeah. Well, that's great. So after choosing the device, and you, you obviously were working with Apple there, they said that you needed to manage these things somehow, right? Uh, you needed to have a management software on there, something called MDM. This is a screenshot from Apple's education page. Um, and we're lucky enough to be mentioned right on there. Um, but I'm wondering if you can just sort of talk through what your experience was like looking at different MDM providers. And, you know, you obviously chose a different one first and, and made a transition here. But, um, you know, how did you guys evaluate your MDM vendor? Well, you know, we were really fortunate from the start that once, um, once we decided that Apple was the direction we wanted to go, um, we had here locally um, – a sales rep that was helpful, uh, but also probably a larger part was even played by their, uh, we had an Apple engineer here locally that we worked really closely with, and they really held our hand um, through those opening few phases and getting us up and running and, and really um, helping us to better understand 
um, what all it takes to, to put a one-to-one -one environment um, in place in a school. Um, and so they, you know, absolutely right out of the gate, they talked about, well, <clears throat> you know, you have to be able to manage the devices. Um, and I, I'll get the number wrong, but I think it's close enough for some perspective that I think originally when we got into the game, there were something like 74 or 75 <laughs> different free MDMs out there available. Um, and so for us, um, again, because a little bit different being the type, being an archdiocesan school the way we are, uh, you know, every dime has to come from somewhere, and it usually comes from our families. And so um, it was certainly uh, in our, our family's best interest to try to be as, as cost savings minded as possible. So when we heard free, we thought, okay, well, that sounds like a good option for us. Um, and so then um, our Apple engineer recommended uh, through his experience what were some of the good free ones out there available. Um, well, it just so happens that um, a large part of our existing um, IT infrastructure uh, was with a vendor that also had a free MDM available. And so we thought, okay, well, it makes natural sense. You know, in theory, they should all work about the same, but um, I guess it just makes sense if, if a lot of our hardware comes from this particular company that let's, let's try to go with their free MDM solution um, from the start to see if, if things won't play nicely together. Um, so that's what we started with. Um, yeah, and, and how did, uh, you know, and, and obviously, you know, we, we came to the point here, uh, you know, where, where it, you know, you decided to do a mid-year transition uh, of these device of, you know, these devices to Jamf. And, um, you know, maybe we can walk through a little bit about, uh, you know, now how you went through that process. And as we're walking through how you went through that process, sort of explain why as well, too. Well, we knew uh, we needed to switch MDMs. So in the, the fall, uh, well, so we deployed the iPads in 2014, 2015. Um, again, it was that blend of BYOD um, and then also the DEP devices. Um, we just had all sorts of trouble with our original MDM. Uh, we don't know if our tokens weren't right, and then getting tech support was not uh, easy to do with our previous MDM. So we we started asking around uh, again a second time to look at moving to a different one, and uh, we we got down to about 13 or 14 that were out there, and they were paid solutions, and we decided that we wanted to uh, basically pursue one of those on the recommendation of our Apple engineer. Uh, he, he said, you know, there's all these out there, they're really good, but I've seen a lot of success with uh, Jamf. And he said that some of the bigger the deployments in Nebraska or his, his area that he covers, that he does a couple different states, but he said they're using Jamf and they're, they can do a lot of things that you guys are describing you want to do. So that's kind of what led us to that. And we uh, took us several months there to uh, kind of get the green light and purchase the licensing. But a big part of all of this was we did some stakeholder surveys in the fall of 2015, and it wasn't a secret that the students could kind of do everything they wanted on the devices, and they weren't managed to uh, the level we wanted them to be. Um, even some of the student surveys were saying, this is very distracting to me because there's stuff on there I can't contain myself, or I'm watching my neighbor play Madden Mobile, and then all of a sudden I've missed 10 minutes of the lecture because I just glanced over and got caught into that. So it was parents, teachers, and students that all said, we need something different. So that's, that evidence right there uh, was definitely uh, something that made us uh, move towards the, the different MDM. Um, again, Mike and I knew early, like, we wanted to do something like this, but this uh, stakeholder survey kind of sealed the deal on us actually making that move. Yeah, that's that's uh, great to hear. And so, uh, you know, rather than waiting until the summer, you guys decided to do it mid-year here. Um, let's now move on to how did you start 
planning for this sort of thing? I mean, where did you start from? Uh, and then, you know, uh, how did you build out this plan? And, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, how did you start executing it? So Mike and I, we work pretty closely together on quite a few projects. And uh, once we kind of got the green light to do this, and then we actually got our own devices, and we went through our jump start and that whole program, um, we, we had intended only to use the devices that um, were going to be DEP devices new this school year, this 2016-2017 school year. So we thought, well, that'll be easy because they'll come and they'll be pointing directly to Jamf and we don't have to touch them or anything. But we bought 800 licenses and had intended only to do the 400 that we bought over the 2016 summer. And our business manager told us uh, that we're going to go ahead and use those 800 licenses. She wasn't going to let them sit a year. So we were kind of forced to jump in. Uh, and maybe, and I'm sorry, maybe explain. The reason we bought 800 was because that was a, that it was more cost effective to actually purchase 800 than it was 400 based on quantity and yeah, everything else. Yeah, so we have volume pricing sometimes. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Yeah. So it was actually going to be less expensive to buy 800 at a cheaper volume price than to buy 400. So yeah, she didn't want us to let those just go to waste. And so uh, on her directive, we kind of decided, well, what could we do or how would we do this? And so we been, began kicking around the idea probably in March when we kind of did our jump start and came up with this plan. Um, we kind of ran it by everybody we needed to. And uh, before we did any of this, we actually uh, worked on a letter for a long time. And I think there's kind of a screenshot a little later of it in this presentation. But yes. basically it was our communication home at what we're doing. And there wasn't a great time to do this because we kept thinking, well, do we get them at the beginning of next school year when they don't have anything on their device? Do we try to pull them in over the summer? Well, beginning of the school year is the worst time of year to implement anything like this. Summer, you're going to get all sorts of kids who skip out even if they got appointments and vacations and all that stuff. So we thought, let's just do it during a school day towards the end of the year, maybe not finals week, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of our plan was, all right, we're going to do it before school gets out. So that was the decision. And then from there, how do we do it? Well, <clears throat> we needed class time to, to communicate to all students. And so we have a couple different uh, courses that all freshmen take, uh, Theology 9, and then they also take English 9. So it's all essentially the same uh, out there uh, for our students to take. And so we went to a department head meeting, and we asked for class time, and, and they after we kind of showed them what Jamf was and what we could do with it, they were excited about that. And they, uh, those two departments gave up their class time. They said, uh, yeah, you can have these two days. Because we told them it would be a day to get the students, uh, basically get their data somewhere where they can retrieve it after a reset. Because you have to reset the device and set it up as brand new for it to point correctly to the Jamf server if you're on one already. So. We needed that class time, and we needed two class periods. You couldn't restore from backup. And you can't restore from backup because it brings in your old MDM. So we kind of had to think about this quite a bit. So when we did that, uh, we got the, the two departments. And actually, theology is what we went with. Uh, we went on, in on a Monday and said, you have one week to move all your stuff that you want to keep into Google Drive. And we just transitioned to being a Google school this year. That was kind of... Uh, Mike, myself, and our principal's project last year was getting that set up. And this is the first year we've been at Google School. But last spring, we actually got to kind of use it and show students how to uh, kind of access and use Drive. And so we went in that Monday, showed them Drive, got them set up on their Google accounts. And then they were able to move their data within that week uh, so that it wouldn't uh, be lost. So we, we gave them a week, and then we went back the following Monday. And when we did that, we said, all right, and we walked them step by step. So Mike took half these classes, I took the others, and we were, we were full all day. We have eight class periods. We went to every class. Uh, we, we made a schedule and everything. Uh, but we basically, on that second visit, we went in and we did step-by-step -step reset, um, basically turning off my iPad, wiping it clean, and then on the setup screen again when they go through, we would remind them that they have to set up as new. We had a few that 
didn't, and it was pretty clear because it just kind of stalled out because it was pointed at the wrong server. Um, but we were able to get all those devices uh, enrolled, and they were pointing at the JAMP server and took on that configuration profile um, in that class period. Yeah, that's... And then <clears throat> the, the big piece that this was the one that we struggled with, how is it going to work exactly, was the BYOD, because we knew the resetting of the iPads was going to be pretty slick because we already pointed them in the DEP to go to the JAMP server after a new reset, but the BYOD, those we had to plug into uh, our MacBooks and configure those. So we had to set up appointments with those. It's probably ended up being about 60 devices, uh, probably 60 to 80, somewhere in there, um, and actually running those. And we could do about two or three at a time, but basically installing those configuration profiles uh, that Jamf helped us create and put in uh, Apple Configurator. And each one of those was probably about a 15-minute process, and we could do two at a time pretty successfully. Mike's tried four before, but um, I bought one of those like six-strip USB <laughs> configure. Yeah, it started smoking. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was we we got most of them done by the end of the year, but there was probably about 15 to 20, and uh, they just were pretty. Uh, Elusive, <laughs> tough to track sure, down. Sure, sure, sure. But, but we got them over the summer, and then when we started school, we had about ten, and I kind of caught them the first day, first couple of days, and and got them taken care of. But um, I wish we would have had maybe a little more time to play with Jamf in the spring, because we didn't even we made them reset. They didn't know it was coming. We didn't actually start using our uh, JSS or, or basically our dashboard mm -hmm. to manage the devices till the fall. So we kind of wish we would have spent some more time messing with things because we, we would turn something on in this fall and then all of a sudden all the apps wouldn't move or whatever we did, all the backgrounds were different. And so we wish we could have played around with it a little bit more and then also set aside more time for those BYOD appointments. We just kind of ran out of time at the end of the year mm -hmm. um, just tracking those kids down. Yeah, and that that is, you know, expect, you know that, that happens, of course, but it's, uh, amazing that you guys were able to, you know, switch over the number of devices that you did in just such a short period of time. And while also dealing with, uh, you know, what I would consider a very unique BYOD uh, scenario as well, too. So uh, kudos to you guys for uh, for getting that done. And uh, I know uh, when we had talked earlier, you mentioned that uh, communication was such a key aspect uh, of this whole thing. Uh, and I, I wanted to just put up that, that letter that you guys uh, wrote and um, you know, it, it is always great to over communicate. And I'm wondering if you just have any thoughts around uh, doing this parent letter and any suggestions that you would have for other schools doing something similar. Um, yeah, I, I would say probably the biggest thing when communicating. Now, again, um, we realize that, that we're sort of a unique environment in, in being a private school. Um, we have that bit of autonomy to tell people that this is what we're going to do uh, and then do it. Um, but most of our folks are pretty compliant and pretty understanding. Um, but at the same part, they, they've got pretty high expectations as well. Um, and so we, yeah, we try to over communicate as much as possible. I guess um, a couple uh, just sort of caveats going in. Um, is you, you want to provide as thorough um, of information as you can, but at the same time, you have to be careful with your details a little bit because you don't want to paint yourselves into any corners either. Um, and so leaving some level of ambiguity in there I think is okay. Uh, because I think what you're going to find is um, certainly switching into a one-to-one -one environment, but then certainly with your MDM and that learning curve and just, just, uh, just the organic nature of it really in, you know, people tech don't typically think of as technology and organic necessarily as going together, but in this case it really is. I mean, it's just so, things are so fluid 
things change so much day to day. Um, just about the time you think you've got something nailed down and it's really running smooth, something will come up that will, will change everything uh, or certainly maybe at least your approach. Um, and so I think a certain level of, like I said, of, of ambiguity or even gray uh, in there is, is okay. Um, don't feel like you need to cover every single little scenario because you can't. There, there are just too many out there um, to try to cover everything. But I think um, the, the best thing you can do for yourself and for your families is just, just try to be as transparent as possible um, and just say, here's what we're going to do um, and here's the reasons we want to do it. Um, and ultimately, I, I think if, if you can get across to the families that we're doing this because it's what's going to help your kids, um, then, then that's always going to be the best approach. And, and writing letters home about technology is really difficult. Of the things that we probably have to communicate home about, it's one of the more difficult because you're, you're trying to reach all audience members, but you have people that have no idea what you're talking about, and then you have people that call you up and then start asking you about your LDAP configuration, and you don't even know what LDAP configuration means. <laughs> so it's kind of this, you gotta, you gotta write to everybody without leaving out information, but also not going over people's heads. So I think that's, I, I found writing these things, uh, these communications home has been very difficult. I mean, we've, We've imp implemented breathalyzing students at football games. Well, that one's pretty easy to write because we have a pretty good objective of what we're trying to do at that. Um, but this is kind of tough to describe, and it's tough not to get too detailed. But um, that, that's one thing that we've kind of discovered is the tech writing is kind of difficult compared to some of the other stuff we have to put out there. Yeah. Well, this is uh, really great information, guys, and great advice. We really appreciate it a lot here. Um, as we wrap up, uh, do you have any other final thoughts, uh, any other uh, suggestions that you'd like to share to uh, other schools that might be in a similar situation as you are? I, I would say uh, leverage your, your network. Um, I mean, I, I found out very soon after we did this that there's a couple other schools that are very close that were using this and I didn't know that I could have talked to them um, just asking around who's using what I mean not even just for um, an MDM but mm -hmm. all like school information systems and, and any any products that you're uh, thinking of deploying school-wide see, see who's out there locally because sometimes it uh, I know nothing against Jamf but I know you guys aren't here locally, so it's kind of nice if I could just run up the street to another high school and say, hey, can we look at the settings you have on this program? Or uh, if you have done this before, what was your experience? Any heads up on anything? Um, I would say leverage your network locally. See if anybody else is, is doing something that you want to do or is already doing it. That's great advice. That's great advice. Well, I'm going to wrap up here with just some next steps now, and then we'll do some uh, some Q&A right after this. Uh, so if you're interested in any of this, uh, head out to Jamf.com, and uh, we can help you uh, get started right away. Uh, if you want to dive deeper into some of the more technical things, uh, we talked a, a little bit about DEP, uh, or Device Enrollment Program. And if you want to learn all about that, check out some of our webinars uh, that talk about zero-touch deployment that really makes it a lot easier to deploy devices where IT doesn't have to touch them at all. Um, and of course, uh, check out Jamf Nation uh, as well, where you can join the discussion online. Guys, do you use Jamf Nation? Yes. yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's a good source of information uh, and just a wonderful community. We're up to now over 40,000 uh, members of Jamf Nation. All right. Thanks, guys. Let's pull up some uh, Q&A. Let me pull up uh, the chat here. So again, if anyone uh, has any questions, please feel free to send them in. Uh, first one I'm seeing here is, uh, is it okay if we can get a copy of that letter? Uh, guys, are you uh, able to, are you willing to share that by any chance? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Should, where should we, how should we get that to you? <laughs> Tell you what, I've got the uh, URL, and I'm going to paste it right now into the uh, WebEx chat. So, 
There we go. Uh, if anyone would like to get it there, you, they can grab it there. Um, let's see, I got another great question here. Uh, so what kind of apps uh, are you pushing onto the iPads? Um, are you doing uh, just an IPA file? Are you doing uh, straight up Apple Store apps? Uh, or are you, doing, uh, are you using VPP? Uh, so what we're doing is kind of a combination. We, we, we push uh, a number of apps that we know students are going to use to their devices, like for instance, the Google Suite or G Suite. Um, we've also uh, used self-service uh, where students can download out of there. So what we did before we started the school year was we sent a, uh, an email to department heads saying, hey, what apps do you need specifically for your department? Um, saying, you know, we're going to cover all the stuff that we use on a regular basis and a lot of non-category items, but what do you need for yours? And so, for example, Music sent us a list of 10 apps that we made available in self-service. And so some of those were for specific music classes. Not all students got those. Um, but they did have one, for example, a paid app that we made a smart group. And we bought the app uh, through VPP. And we were able to distribute to that smart group. And then next year, we'll adjust that smart group so then different students receive that app. And then students that may be graduated or are no longer in choir um, we'll have that removed. So we kind of do a blend. We don't do codes anymore. We did originally mm -hmm. um, with our original MDN just because we couldn't ever get it to work quite right or it just took forever. But now we have a little more uh, flexibility on both the VPP apps and then the ones that are available in self-service and then just ones that we push to them because we know they'll need them. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just make a, a, a comment here about some of the tech that's happened in the background. Uh, Apple's really made VPP a lot easier over the past few years, uh, moving to the um, uh, managed distribution so you don't have to mess with all the codes. Uh, you just get a license for the apps. Uh, and now being able to deploy apps to uh, devices without an Apple ID as well, too. That's uh, a huge win and for a lot of uh, education um, uh, schools out there. Um, yep. Another great question. So um, let's talk about some of the restrictions that you put on the iPads. Uh, specifically, uh, wanting to know if you allow things like uh, iCloud backup or just signing into iCloud in general. We do. Um, but what we've done through, for the school day is we have a restriction profile that I turn on at 730 in the morning, and then Mike turns it off at about 4 in the afternoon. And basically what this profile has is it's a list of apps we allow. And these apps that we – okay. Uh, sorry, someone came in. Nope, that's uh, right. We have, <laughs> we have apps that we allow during the school day. We don't give them the app store. So anything they need, they can always go get out of self-service. They don't, even though they don't have the App Store, because we figure they're at school, it's a school device, we want them to have school content. Then at night, they get to put in their own Apple ID, they have their own App Store, and we wanted them to have the freedom to explore on their own. And I have students come to me all the time and say, hey, I found this really good app for keeping my assignments in order, whatever the case may be. I'll throw it into self-service if anybody else wants it. So that's kind of what we look at uh, as far as how we manage it, and that's the profile. We do require a passcode. That's a, a different profile. We require notifications on because we're pretty heavy on the Google products, and when you, someone shares something with you, we want them to be notified they have an email so they can't pretend they didn't see it. Um, so we have about eight different configuration tools uh, that we kind of drop in. Some, seven of the eight are on at all times. That's great. Um, and just, we did take away AirDrop because we also don't include messaging during the day. Yeah. So they were dropping messages, uh, but we took that away. Got it. <laughs> um, I wanted to give just a little context for maybe some of those who uh, haven't really played around with uh, config profiles before. Uh, this yeah. is this is the interface uh, to uh, the Jamf server here, and um, 
this is where you can define what's known as configuration profiles, uh, which has uh, payloads to restrict some of those certain things. So uh, like you were talking about how you restrict uh, apps, right? Um, these are all functionalities that you can now do thanks to uh, MDM uh, as the technology and us implementing it as a product here. So you can um, you know, blacklist or whitelist certain apps and allow uh, all this sorts of things. And it's up to, you know, you as an organization to determine what level of restrictions that you would like. Yeah, if you were to click on that applications tab there, um, and then if you go down a little bit on that restrict, we say uh, only allow some apps. And we, we physically drop those in which ones we want. Yeah. Where other schools try and think of, oh, well, let's block this app, let's block this app. That's a pretty big undertaking as a school and, and someone managing this kind of stuff. So we just think what we do want versus uh, <laughs> trying to go backwards and as things come up, then put them in there. So that's what we've done as far as our restriction profile during the day is just allow some apps. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. And what's nice is you can remove that at any time you want. Correct. Yeah, we, we toggle. Uh, it, it, we could probably put in a script that would do it automatically, but we have so many weird days where it's a late start because of a faculty meeting. We have this holiday. We have Christmas break. And so for us to think about a calendar uh, and, and put that into some sort of script that would do that, um, for us it just works easier. It's just kind of the first thing I do when I get here. It's kind of like unlocking the door. Yeah, so. nice. <laughs> Um, great question around Apple IDs. So, you know, you mentioned you, you allow your students to log in with their own Apple IDs when they're at home. Um, do you guys provide them with an Apple ID at all? We do not. And the reason we did that um, was, one, we, we wanted them to, if they did make purchases, be able to move them uh, as they go. Maybe they, they found a cool art app that they want to take on and for themselves and but we also have families that uh, have several siblings. So we've done some family share uh, or whatever that Apple program is mm -hmm. where you can buy a book and distribute it out um, to, I think it's up to five people. Um, but we also have some families that share one Apple ID across all devices. So and that's always kind of a mess. Um, <laughs> but we, we do allow them to kind of choose what's best for their family and the Apple IDs. A lot of parents not a lot, but some parents like a little more control, and then others have had a, uh, a student that's had a, an iPhone since they were, you know, sixth grade, and yeah. this is nothing new to them. So we kind of let families make that choice on the Apple ID. If they wanted to set one up and wanted our help, we would, but we don't issue those out. Yeah. And, you know, in the past, I think a lot of schools were um, – had to navigate that uh, because you needed an Apple ID to get an app onto the devices. Uh, and thanks to some changes Apple made with iOS 9, uh, you know, you no longer need that at all to, so, uh, to actually put an app on there. Yep. So um, another great question here. So what are the challenges that you have now? And, um, you know, more specifically, what are things that MDM in general doesn't cover yet for you, and uh, what can't Apple sort of provide? Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to, to know kind of where you see, you know, what Apple can do to improve the MDM technology in general uh, that you might be missing something. I'll, I'll throw out a, a common one that I hear in the marketplace. It's, um, you know, right now you, there's no way to block iOS updates. Um, you can force iOS updates, but there's no way to actually block them. Uh, and that's something that's not in the MDM spec. Uh, do you have any other sort of like similar challenges? Yeah, like that? I have one. Uh, the Find My iPad, uh, being able to ding that, play that sound from the JSS. Oh, sure. Yep. So we can get students that... Uh, I get a lot of kids that forget their Apple ID, so we spend 10 minutes for them to reset their password. Uh, and then once they're into iCloud, then they can ding it. But if I could just go into the JSS and hit, because I can, I can erase the device, I can, I can clear the passcode, but for some reason I'm not allowed to 
um, make it ding so we can find it in the building because we got 730 of those devices floating around with the same cover. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and actually, that that might have been uh, that might have been addressed actually in a recent uh, recent build here. Oh really? Yep, I think it's something new that Apple just came out with. But uh, I want to I want to I was just trying to poke around it to make sure I have an iPad that's enrolled to find it. Yeah, the other one is uh, well, so. Again, back to that idea of everything being sort of organic and fluid and flexible. Um, obviously, especially in a high school scenario, you're always, it's always going to be this large game of cat and mouse um, and trying to stay one step ahead of the students because um, there's just two of us trying to stay ahead of 730 of them. Um, and so just collectively, um, they're going to outwit us eventually. Um, and so they're <laughs> always aiming, plotting, trying to come up with some new way of getting around restrictions. Well, so there's give and take a little bit with our restriction scenario. We, we work with another school close by that they create their restriction profiles, they slap it on when they start, and it stays on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so a consequence of that, their students don't do a whole heck of a lot with their iPad. They just don't leave them at school. Uh, they just don't do much with them. Whereas for us, uh, back to what Oliver had said earlier, we, we want them to take ownership. We want them to explore. We want them to be able to do the things they want to do. Now, do we want them watching Stranger Things while they're at school and they should be doing calculus? No. Uh, but when they're at home at night, um, and they want to be doing their own thing, we want that, them to have that option too. So that restriction profile, the way we turn it on and turn it off, has an inherent issue with it a little bit in that some of our students have figured out if they've got something um, that is stored locally on the device. For instance, Netflix recently allows for downloading um, of shows, just like Amazon Prime Video has. So what students will do is they will, um, at night, they'll download a movie, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Then when they come to school, they'll turn off their wireless. Because when they arrive at school, they'll have it off before they come. Right, they'll have it off before they come so that it never, it never will attach onto our wireless network at school so that restriction profile won't take until it connects to our wireless network. Yeah. So that way, if they want to watch their show in first hour study hall or maybe even in first hour geometry class, um, they can do that because our restrictions won't enable until they hit our wireless network. So um, we're constantly working with trying to just for our staff even make it, make it part of your daily procedures. First period, when you're taking attendance, have all the kids do something that requires them to get on the wireless network just so once that happens then the wireless profile can take and, and we're good to go. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. Uh, there, there's certainly um, you know things that Apple could improve on MDM there to uh, not allow users to uh, turn on airplane mode, for example. Um, but uh, I know they always tend to um, balance that line between, you know, is it a tech solution or is it a um, sort of a human solution in a way, right? And it sounds like you guys have addressed that in, um, you know, in a, a very human way of saying at least, you know, check in on your iPad uh, when you get to school and then it, the technology sort of takes over there. And, and another thing is, uh, and we said when they get to school, but this com configuration profile flipping on and flipping off, uh, it takes anywhere. So if they're at home, we get kids that are sick, and, oh, and sure. <laughs> uh, they get the restriction profile because it doesn't matter where you're at or what network you're on. It still takes because the device checks in with the Jamf server. So uh, we get emails from kids saying, "Hey, I, I'm sick today. Uh, can you uh, turn off restrictions?" And we don't, but um, some, sometimes. There'll be a group gone for three days for some sort of a, a band trip or whatever. We'll make a, a, a static group yeah. where we allow them to have and not get that profile. Um, so the, but mostly for everyone's safety on a plane with a bunch of high school kids. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
Uh, great. Well, we've got uh, one more question that kind of came in, and it, it's a little, uh, you know, uh, asking sort of why did you choose Jamf over uh, other specific MDM providers? I know one of the uh, they mentioned one of the bigger ones, AirWatch. Um, uh, if you want to uh, make any comments around other vendors that you might have evaluated, uh, basically, we were kind of pointed in this direction from our Apple engineer, um, and that was his basically decision uh, based on what we told him we wanted to do. Um, it wasn't anything about those others. He knows about those others, and he said, well, you can go with this one, this one, this one, but what you want to do, uh, I would definitely look into Jamf. And basically, we're pretty trustworthy of, of what he's pointing us to um, just because of his experience. And he's a very honest guy, and um, he'll, he'll call us names if he needs to about things that we've done. Um, but he, we, we kind of trusted his discretion on where we should probably go. And, and a, after we did a couple demos with others, we just kind of felt like this is what we wanted. And I, I think, too, that the tech support was probably a big, a big sales point for us. Um, we, it's kind of the running joke with, with several of the different groups that we work with that if anybody's able to find a bug in a system, it's us. <laughs> um, so we're, we seem to have this knack for finding something that doesn't work or something that someone hadn't thought of before. Um, and so we spend a lot of time working, we're on first name basis with a lot of tech support folks around the country. Um, but certainly Jamf. Um, the, the tech support and the relationships that we've been able to form with, with the folks there at JAMP and their willingness um, to, to help us, even if it's some sort of new issue, um, they're, they're great. I mean, just the responses are very thorough, they're very timely, um, and they're willing to take sort of feedback from us as well to help sort of shape um, their own progression. Well, thanks, guys. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, well, that uh, that just about does it here. Um, and uh, again, I want to thank you guys so much uh, for joining us and uh, just telling your story. Uh, and um, uh, you know, it's it's such a, a a great inspiration to see kind of what you've been able to do uh, with these iPads and uh, to create a really unique management solution. So, thank you, guys. You bet. Great. Thank you.